Hey guys, Buildzoid here from actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the most expensive and largest motherboard I've ever done a PCB breakdown of. Say hello to the Asus ROG X599 Dominus uh, motherboard. This thing is designed for overclocking the LGA3647 Xeon W3175X. And if you're wondering why I'm trying to talk so fast, uh, com basically Steve told me I need to make the video shorter, and the first take was like 37 minutes. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and its Straight Power 11 series power supplies. The Straight Power 11 PSUs ship from 450 watts up to 1000 watts, accommodating most of the gaming PC build requirements you'd encounter, and focuses on delivering a higher quality power supply that doesn't sacrifice on efficiency or stability. Noise is also a heavy point for the Straight Power 11 using a 135mm Silent Wings 3 fan that can spin as low as 200 RPM for quieter low load operation. Learn more at the link in the description below. Anyway, let's get right into it because there's so much stuff to cover on this motherboard. Before we get into the VRMs, we're just going to start off with uh, um, some of the features and of course the power connectors. We've got a uh, a truckload of power connectors. <laughs> Almost made this uh, video, uh, what, ad advertiser unfriendly. Anyway, so we have a ton of freaking power connectors and we also have a split 12 volt power plane. You can just about see how the 12 volt power plane ends right there. And the reasoning for this is rather simple and it's also part of the reasoning why we have these extra six pins here. So uh, also the motherboard has dual 24 pin power connectors. So the reason that we have this split 12 volt power plane up in, up on the top edge and the dual 24 pins is very, very simple. This powers, uh, this motherboard is designed to work with dual PSU setups and that's why we have not, not you know, one or two or three eight pins. No, we have four eight pin power connectors. And the issue with having four eight pin power connectors, right? Like one, two, uh, three, four. So the issue with doing that is that most high-end PSUs, even like 1600 watt power supplies, which I have two of, uh, <laughs> they only come with like two eight pin power connectors each. So essentially you wouldn't be able to hook up like four eight pins onto this motherboard at the same time. Now, if you do have a 1600 watt power supply, I would argue you shouldn't bother with the eight pins. Like and that's kind of the reason why we have the extra six pin power connectors here, because essentially what you would want to do if you had a 1600 watt power supply is just plug that in, plug that in, um, plug this in and plug this in and you're sorted. You don't have to worry about it. Now, admittedly, at that point, you'd probably want to throw another PSU in the system for powering like your GPUs, depending on how many GPUs you have or how power hungry said GPUs are and how much you're overclocking the CPU. But a single 1600 watt PSU might actually be like, if you're on water cooling, you're probably not going to be able to cool the CPU if it's pulling much more than like 800 watts. Uh, that tends to be actually really, really freaking difficult. Um, Anyway, uh, so actually not even 800 watts, like good luck cooling over 600 because this is this is one big monolithic, very hot die um, that this Xeon comes with. So anyway, so we have the, the six pins for people who want to run single PSU, but if you want to run dual PSU, then you can plug in, you know, uh, two eight pins over here and two eight pins over there. And, you know, each of those eight pins will be coming, uh, like those eight pins will be coming from d different power supplies. And so you need to split the 12 volt power plane here because uh, if you have two different power supplies, you're not necessarily guaranteed that they're both outputting exactly the same 12 volts, depending on what kind of load each is under. And if you had them on the same power plane, you'd basically end up with one PSU feeding current back into the other PSU, and that can lead to all kinds of issues. So you can't actually have two different power supplies on the same, like outputting power into the same power plane. Basically, they'll end up fighting each other. And so that's not an option. So the end result here is that we do have that split 12 volt power plane. So if you do want to run PSU, uh, you know, two PSU setup, you'd have like, you have PSU one, um, and then PSU two over here, right on this side. Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a requirement. Like personally, I would say it would be easier to just set up like one power supply for the CPU and then another power supply for the rest of the system. But uh, you, you have a lot of options. Also, you don't actually like, even if you're on ambient cooling, as I said, uh, if you're on water cooling, like good luck cooling much more than 600 or 800 watts coming off of a monolithic uh, die like on the Xeon, especially considering that this thing comes with thermal paste, it's not soldered. So uh, for most applications, I don't think you'd actually need to plug in more than just like, you know, uh, say like this eight pin and that eight pin. Like that wouldn't realistically probably be about the limit of most of what most people's cooling system would be able to handle in this configuration. Now, as soon as you're looking at like chilled water, then yeah, you know, you'd want like a 1600 watt power supply just for the CPU and hook it up like that. 
Um, but it is worth noting, um, like worth keeping in mind that uh, Der Bauer actually did an LN2 overclocking video with Dan Kopp on this motherboard with the Xeon, and they ended up topping out at like 1225 watts. So it, it really like, and that that's like coming into the VRM, that's not output. So you really like, the thing is so damn hard to cool that I honestly don't think this huge array of power connectors is anywhere near necessary, especially considering that like an eight pin uh, CPU power connector can easily handle 400 watts plus. And if you have uh, the sort of the high current version of that power connector and also a PSU using 16 gauge cabling for all of its, uh, you know, main power lines, then actually this connector can handle as much as 600 watts uh, quite easily because it can do 13 amps per pin pair. And the same goes for the, uh, like for the extra six pins on the side, right? So you basically have like a 600 watt connector there. And then these are like just under 400 watts or something like that. So you have like 2000 watts worth of power connectors here if you have the high current, like, you know, uh, variant of the eight pin and the six pin on your power supply, because some power supplies, well, most power supplies tend to be done in 18 gauge, but the high end ones really should be done in 16. Um, anyway, so basically we have a ton of power connectors that are really quite excessive, but that's kind of the, the, the tr like that theme of excessive amounts of everything just holds true for the rest of the motherboard, as we shall soon see. Uh, moving on, uh, we get a power button, a reset button. We also have a retry button. So this basically forces the system to power cycle, even if it locks up to the point that like the reset doesn't work. Uh, retry will force the system to power cycle. Uh, the other benefit of the retry button is that you can use it for retraining memory settings. So if there's there's like a couple different postcodes that you can get stuck on when the memory training is not quite right. Um, yeah, mashing the retry button can get you through some of those. They, they'd be things like... Uh, like sometimes when you get into like the final initialization postcodes, you can lock up on those. Retry can get you through those sometimes. Uh, then like 55s, 49s, and there's a couple other ones. Uh, it really kind of depends also on the platform which postcodes are retriable through and which aren't. So uh, I'm just kind of going with what I'm used to on like Z390, Z370, and uh, Z270 in terms of what retry can go through. So anyway, that, that's a nice feature to have and it's pretty standard for all like extreme overclocking oriented uh, Asus ROG motherboards. Uh, below that we have the safe boot button. This is a really, really awesome button. Basically allows you to get into the BIOS without having to wipe all of your settings, if, even if your settings are screwed up. So essentially if you're, you know, if you're getting a postcode that retry button doesn't get you through, you can just hit safe boot and it should get you into the BIOS and it won't even wipe all of your settings, which is awesome because if you forget to save profiles like I do, you don't lose all your work every <laughs> to clear CMOS, right? Like, so yeah, that, that's a really awesome button to have. Uh, we do also have the postcode, which is obviously for troubleshooting. We, I don't think they have the color coded LEDs on this motherboard. So anyway, not really like the postcode makes those kind of irrelevant even when they are present. Uh, next we have the, uh, these, uh, this dip switch right here, which is for enabling and disabling your PCIe slots. Considering that this is super like freaking high end and like workstation oriented, this is not actually that much PCIe expansion capability on this motherboard. But uh, yeah, so you can basically disable and enable PCIe slots with, with just the dip switch right here, which is super handy if you have like a GPU that's in like a water loop or under liquid nitrogen and it's not posting and it's because one of the GPUs isn't working and you have several of them, well, you can just fiddle with that dip switch until the system starts working. Bam, you don't even have to worry about pulling the, GP uh, the malfunctioning GPU out of the system. Much more convenient uh, for troubleshooting in that sense. Um, also up here, we get two more switches. We get pause and uh, reserved one. So I'm not sure what reserved one does for X599, but for most other platforms where you'd find this switch uh, from Asus on Asus motherboards, it essentially preloads a bunch of extreme overclocking settings for you. This switch is not enabled unless you have the LN2 mode uh, jumper enabled. And uh, quite frankly, th like flicking the switch on like say Z270 or something at ambient will straight up make the system not post. It's also really not good for the system to be running like that in in the first place. So yeah, th this is very much just for extreme overclocking. Then above that, we have the pause switch. Uh, this will basically force lock up the system, well, like force lock up the CPU. Um, essentially, you can pause the CPU, uh, which is really, really neat. It doesn't pause the passage of time, and the idea behind this is essentially that you can adjust settings on, say, like benchmark loading screens. So you get to a benchmark loading screen, you hit pause, and then if you have like an ROG OC panel or some kind of other, you know, direct to motherboard controller, you can adjust a bunch of settings, un un uh, flick pause back off, and 
uh, benchmark runs at different settings than what, what like the first test of the benchmark uh, ran at, which can be useful for say like for 3D marks especially because they have a lot of loading screens. Anyway, so that's those two switches up there. I think I've covered everything in that area. So moving down, down here we have the slow mode switch essentially allows you to force the, the CPU to the lowest possible multiple, uh, lowest possible core ratio. Uh, very convenient for basically avoiding crashes while you're sitting at idle. Like, you know, if you're on desktop and like messing around with files or setting something up while on liquid nitrogen, this is a great way to both save liquid nitrogen because uh, power consumption is roughly linear with your uh, CPU frequency. And also uh, it avoids stability issues because you won't have to be like taking it, like you wouldn't have to save a screenshot at six gigahertz, right? You can take your screenshot, hit slow mode, save at like 0.8 gigahertz. So that, that's a pretty nice switch to have for extreme overclockers. That also only enables once you have LN2 mode enabled. Uh, LN2 mode, uh, it enables a bunch of the switches on the motherboard. It also, what it does is it presets some voltages for extreme overclocking and it, um, and it lifts a whole bunch of voltage restrictions. So normally Asus motherboards won't let you go to like stupid voltage levels unless you have this enabled. Once you have this enabled, you can burn the CPU and the motherboard won't like won't do anything to stop you from doing that. So uh, yeah, um, that's that's pretty neat. Uh, next to that, we have a six pin power connector. This is just for adding extra power into the PCIe slots. This I would assume has to be on whichever PSU is hooked up to this 24 pin, because normally the way this is implemented is it's actually in parallel with the 12 volt pins of the 24 pin. So yeah, and uh, it's nice to see Aces finally using a six pin for this, because normally they use a Molex and I hate the Molex connector. So yeah, uh, <laughs> nice to see that th they are using a six pin for this. At this point, um, and the idea is basically, if you're running a like a four-way GPU setup, let, uh, God forbid, like let's say you you run like four-way RX 480s, reference RX 480s, right? They pull a lot of power from the PCIe slot. Yeah, you run four of those, you're going to melt your 24 pin. Um, and the dual 24 pins, again, same reason why uh, as for why you have a split 12 volt power plane up there. These can't be in parallel in terms of feeding power into the motherboard. So you do need a separate power extra power connector to feed the PCIe slots extra. Um, which would have to come from the PSU, which is on the primary 24 pin. Um, anyway, so if you had like RX 480s or something, then they could easily pull, say, 300 watts through the PCIe slots. And at that point, your 24 pin is going to melt because there's exactly two 12 volt pins in that 24 pin power connector. And uh, well, you know, 12 times uh, 10, you know, per pin is like 240 watts and you're trying to pull 300. Um, not going to happen. So... Yeah, that's that's essentially why there there's this power connector, and you see that on quite a few high-end motherboards these days as well. So, pretty standard feature. Anyway, moving on, uh, we have a BIOS switch. This motherboard has dual BIOS, which is super convenient. If you brick one of the BIOS, uh, uh, one of the BIOS chips, and then you still have a working motherboard because there's a backup BIOS chip that still works. Then we have a reserved two switch. I have no idea what that one does. I've never actually had an Asus motherboard that has a second reserved switch. I've only had motherboards with one. I assume it adds more settings on top of what the first one does. That, that would be my guess as to how that functions. Um, and that kind of covers everything except for the 10 gig Aquantia LAN that is located right over here. So at this point, we've covered all of the features. Now we can move on to the VRMs. And uh, let's start with the biggest one and most important one, which is actually not this entire row up here um, because the memory VRM for this set of DIMM slots is actually hiding in that. So this right here is VDDR. Um, so we have VDDR over there, and that feeds this set of DIMM slots. This is a, uh, the M.2 riser card thing, so that's for M.2 SSDs. That's not an extra DIMM slot, and Asus calls, calls it DIMM.2 because they basically repurposed a, I think it's a DDR4 slot, and then they've like flipped it around and put that over it so that you can't install, install a DIMM in it because it's really just meant to be a riser card for M.2 SSDs. Um, so anyways, uh, over there we have our VDDR, then we of course have our VCC in VRM, which is freaking huge, um, which has a lot of power stages, but not quite that many phases. Uh, then we have VDDR over here as well, because of course you do, because like you're not going to be pushing power like that. That's that's just dumb. Um, so normally uh, you always have like the basically a VRM on either side of the CPU if there's separate, you know, if you have memory uh, memory slots on either side of the, the CPU socket, then you have VRMs on either side as well. So that's our other VDDR VRM. 
um, over there. And then down here, we have what I can only assume are VCCIO and VCCSA. The only issue is I'm not sure which one's which because I, uh, well, um, I don't have the board in hand to check. So VCCIO and uh, VCCSA. It doesn't really matter that much. Both of these are rather minor rails and uh, they don't like they don't push much power. And more importantly, these two things like these two phases are identical. So it doesn't really matter which one's which. It's just kind of like, yeah, the, because they're, the spec on them is the same and they both don't really have to do much work anyway. So um, let's get into the details of the VCC and VRM here. And as you can clearly see, it's freaking massive. So we're not going to be counting how many phases are in it, because I mean, how many inductors are in it, because we'd be here all day. But we will split it up into the into the phase groups here. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Four, yes, and another one, two, three, four, and another one, two, three, four. There, and essentially you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, this motherboard has 32 power stages in its VCC and VRM and eight phases. Yep. Um, Asus really freaking hates doublers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's basically the design philosophy behind this VRM. But so you have a total like it's a it's a real eight phase, um, but you basically have a whole bunch of power stages in parallel in each phase. And the funny thing is, is actually at this point, um, what Asus is doing with this VRM is like I was actually wondering like when I, when I did my efficiency calculations, I was actually wondering why they didn't go for only twenty four power stages because if you're not going to use a doubler, there's nothing actually stopping you from putting three phase like putting three power stages in one phase. Normally, if you're using a doubler, then it's like well, it doubles, okay, and you can't buy triplers as far as I'm aware. Nobody makes those, but they do make quadruplers, and you can cascade doublers into other doublers, which would give you a quadrupler made up of three different component uh, of made up of three separate doublers. So. Essentially, um, you know, Asus could have gone for like a more reasonable power stage count, as we're about to find out. But uh, no, nah, they, they like the thing is, this motherboard is eighteen hundred dollars. So even though th like these power stages are like four dollars each, um, it doesn't really make a big difference to the total cost of the motherboard. There's like one hundred and fifty dollars worth of power stages here, but the board's like eighteen hundred dollars. Like who cares? And you can see a similar kind of thing going on with the actual voltage controller selection, because this chip right here, well, that's that's for VC. CCN and that's an ASP uh, 1405. So, which uh, the suspicion is that that is a rebrand of the IR35201 um, because it behaves a like it seems to behave a lot like an IR35201. Um, anyway, and Asus has rebranded voltage controllers for ages, but normally uh, you don't see ASP 1405s used for like memory of things like memory power, especially considering that if I remember correctly. IR makes a 35204, which is basically a 35201 in terms of like features, except with less phases, so it's cheaper, except this motherboard is $1,800, so why would you bother with buying a cheaper voltage regulator when you can just use another ASP1405? Um, so that's what's going on here, and that's only running one, two, three phases. So th this one's running like, uh, th the one up here is running eight plus zero. This one down here is running three plus zero. This one over here, uh, right there, that's another three plus a zero. Um, so that's another ASP 1405. And even the VCCIO and VCCSA, yeah, you, you guessed it. It's another ASP 1405 because just it's easier to, to use the same chip everywhere. And it doesn't like you don't need to bother with saving money on an $1,800 motherboard. It's ridiculously expensive anyway. Like who cares if the chip is a dollar more expensive at this point? Um, so yeah, that's, that's another ASP 1405, uh, 1405, and that one's running in one plus one mode, which is just like a complete waste because you can really, you, you can buy like a three phase or four phase controller from IR that would do that just fine and have like the exact same performance metrics as a 352, like as a ASP 1405, except it wouldn't be, uh, you know, quite as expensive or quite as large. It would take up less board space. Like basically Asus was like, well, the board's huge. It's expensive. Who cares about, you know, being even remotely cost efficient at this point? And the same kind of applies to the situation with the ridiculous number of power stages in the VRM because the end result of this mon monstrosity of a VRM is that uh, for the standard, uh, 
sort of so let, like let's finally take a look at the vrm efficiency here right um so for 1.8 volts output 600 kilohertz switching frequency um and five volts drive because these are well we're, we're we're gonna get to that um five volts drive so that's that's the vrm operating setup so that's 1.8 volts out and that's 1.8 volts because this is vcc in so that goes into the integrated voltage regulator on the cpu which is basically a very very, very fast uh, buck converter built directly into the chip. And that, that's a really cool feature that Intel has for like reducing the amount of current a motherboard has to supply to the CPU. And it's super useful in server applications and laptop applications and just all over the place. Um, and they also don't use it on LGA 1151. But uh, anyway, so uh, those are going to be our operating parameters for the VRM because these chips right here are none other... <laughs> These guys right here are none other than the TDA uh, 21472. This is one of the most expensive 70 amp, amp, uh, 70 amp smart power stages you can buy. And Asus decided that they really, really, really needed 32 of them in the VCC and VRM. Um, like they didn't, but they, they just kind of went with it. So, and these are actually spec to just run off of straight five volts all the time. And th th this is just what they're spec'd at in the data sheet. So that, that's really convenient for me because it makes the math real easy. Um, yeah, so, uh, 70 amp smart power stages. They're called smart power stages because they integrate current monitoring, temperature monitoring, over current protection, over temperature protection, um, high side MOSFET failure protection. Like there's a whole bunch of protection modes built into these that makes them uh, really awesome in that they shouldn't, like, if they fail, on, on the off chance that they fail, because they're ridiculously powerful, but, you know, let's say they do fail for some reason or another, uh, they actually have built-in mechanisms to protect against, like, blowing up everything uh, after the VRM, which can actually happen with, like, discrete MOSFETs if they fail closed, and, and there's nothing to to force the low-side MOSFET uh, to, to basically try pull the, the high-side MOSFET down. Because um, anyway, um, <laughs> getting off track here because we don't have enough time. The other feature that these integrate being uh, made by International Rectifier, um, they do integrate body braking mode, which is basically a load to idle transient response optimization feature, which essentially uh, disables the low side MOSFET. Well, you stop using the low side MOSFET of the power stage when you're coming out of load into idle. And the idea is that basically that forces all of the current going through the phase to go through the body diode of the MOSFET, and hence the name body braking mode. Um, and the body diode has a whole bunch of voltage drop, so you can burn off all the extra energy uh, that's sitting in the phase that would otherwise cause a voltage spike as you come out of load. Yeah, you can burn that off and you get a better transient, uh, better uh, transient response coming out of load. So when you go from like you know high current output to low current output, you don't get as, as much of a voltage spike because of body braking mode. Um, so that's a pretty cool feature that these integrate, which is actually like that's not a standard feature for smart power stages. That that's just something that International Rectifier adds. Though there are like Intercell has that as well. They can also do it. They they just have different uh, different names for this. So anyway, um, let's talk about the VRM efficiency here. And it, it's ridiculous because so for, for convenience sake, 270 watts, um, which is a little bit above the stock TDP of the Xeon that goes into it, which is like 255, um, 255 watts. But I was lazy and I wanted to go with 150 amps. So 150 amps current output. This VRM is going to produce about 19 watts of heat. You don't need a heatsink at all. Like this doesn't need a VRM heatsink whatsoever if you're running that Xeon at stock. It's just completely irrelevant. Like this, like th there's so much sur surface area in this VRM that you just don't need a heatsink. So that's awesome. Now moving up into the higher current levels, right? 540 watts power consumption, 300 amps. And this is likely what, like, th this is pretty hard to cool. Like, that's actually really hard to cool um, it, it, with, like, a water cooling loop. So 300 amps output for the VRM at that point. You're still only going to be looking at about 35 watts of heat. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the VRM was perfectly capable of dissipating that by just existing, as in you don't need a heat sink on it, and maybe a gentle breeze would be enough. Um, so... Yeah, th this VRM is just ridiculous freaking overkill. Um, moving up higher in terms of power consumption, 810 watts, um, 450 amps. I did go in steps of 150 just because it doesn't like it doesn't really matter. Um, 
Well, I'm not sure how high you can push it, but anyway, so 810 watts, 450 amps. Uh, you'd be looking at only about 48 watts of heat. Uh, at that point, having a heatsink might be a good idea, but airflow would be still, I consider, optional. Um, because, yeah, this, this is just ridiculous. There's so many damn power stages in this. Anyway, going yet further still with our power consumption, 1,080 watts. Okay. Um, 600 amps output on this VRM. You'd be looking at about 61 watts of heat. Um, overkill. Massive freaking overkill because the board's $1,800. So it doesn't matter if we blow like, like this VRM probably costs like 200, like is like $200 in parts, maybe, maybe more than that. Um, like definitely in just power stages, you're looking at over $100 because each of those TDA 21472s is four bucks. So you're looking at like $128 worth of power stages. Um, and then you have to also factor in the inductors, which I'm not sure what, what ASUS is going for those. We have tantalum, uh, like the output filtering capacitors right here. Those are actually tantalum. Those are rather expensive generally. And then you have more of them on the back of the board, as you can clearly see right here. Um, and then if we go back to the front of the board, like th th this VRM is just, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous and very expensive, but ultimately it doesn't like, still, even if this VRM is like $180 to, to build, it's only 10% of the total price of the motherboard, right? Whereas a lot of other motherboards, say for like X299 or, um, or other like less ridiculous platforms like this, the VRM would actually be a much more significant percentage of the total cost of the motherboard. Uh, and here it's just like, well, who cares? <laughs> it's, it's not a, like even if it's a hundred and eighty dollars worth of uh, components for the VRM, ten percent of the motherboard's total cost. Uh, actually, ten percent of the motherboard's retail cost, which for a lot of other boards, it, it's much, much higher than that. So, yeah. Anyway, moving on to a thirteen, and I'm on the wrong layer. Moving on to 1,350 watts, which is actually like higher than so far any, like I've not heard of this uh, this CPU pulling more like that amount of power yet, okay? Um, Derbauer, as I said earlier, they did, uh, Derbauer and Dankop did a LN2 overclocking session with this motherboard and they topped out around 200, uh, 1,225 watts uh, that was going into the VRM, so not even coming out of. Um, which basically tells us that, you know, if 200, uh, 1225 watts was going in, then we were probably looking at something around like 1150-ish watts coming out of the VRM. And yes, at that point, you would actually want like a heat sink and some airflow, but you're on liquid nitrogen, so the board is very likely freezing over in this area anyway, at least until the CPU starts running, because that's going to very quickly just, that, that's like one massive uh, heater right there. So... Yeah, absolutely, like, ridiculous VRM on this board. Um, and it is only eight phases, which I, I guess Asus is just like, we, we hate doublers for some reason, which, uh, I mean, sure, I guess. Uh, like, this is still an eight phase, and if you set the switching frequency high enough, then, you know, your output ripple is definitely going to be fine. Also, output ripple is really dependent on how you actually set up your output filtering uh system though your input ripple on this thing is like would be kind of terrifying honestly because the the thing you have to understand is like if you have say 600 amps going through this vrm um which is kind of an inconvenient work uh, number to work with but let's say let's say you have like 400 amps uh 400 amps going through this vrm right if any like one phase turns on that's essentially a 50 amp current spike on the like for the psu well, I mean, it's going to be, you know, clean. Well, it is going to be suppressed by all of these capacitors right here, but that's still like there. there's a re like doublers would actually reduce the the uh, input ripples quite significantly as well. And you can con like, again, you can compensate for that with just more capacitors. Right. And this board certainly doesn't have a shortage of those. But uh yeah, you know, it's just kind of interesting that Asus is going with this design decision to just not use doublers basically at all anywhere. And um, but here I don't really see a problem with that because this is still an eight phase. And so you almost have full overlap. Well, actually, at 1.8 volts output, this would technically have almost full overlap between phases, as in um, like this phase will stop uh, like this phase would turn off right as this phase is actually turning on. Um, so your actual like it wouldn't be 
like if you had a lower output voltage and your duty cycles were really short, then you'd actually end up with something that looks like this on the 12 volt side. But since the duty cycle is rather long for 1.8 volts output, you're going to be looking at something that looks more like this, right? And that's actually like, that's pretty smooth. So you'd actually not have that much ripple on the input anyway. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's still crazy freaking eight phase right here, but it is still just an eight phase, definitely not a 32. But uh, I, I don't really see a problem with this. Um, it's just kind of interesting that th this is how Asus likes to design their boards these days, especially considering that they've used a lot of doublers in the past. Uh, anyway, moving on to the memory VRMs, I mean, like the VCCN v v was ridiculous overkill. VDDR is more of the same. First of all, it's three phase memory power for our, uh, you know, six DIMM slots per Per side, of, per side of motherboard. I am not sure what memory topology this board uses. I'm going to guess it's T topology just because that would make the most sense for supporting very high memory densities, whereas daisy chain would technically overclock better as long as you didn't populate all the dims, but this is a workstation platform. You're probably going to like, on the off chance that you're buying this, you're probably going to want to populate all the dims for whatever, you know, applicate work application you actually have. This is a stupid platform for playing games on because a 9900K is actually probably better at playing games than this Xeon will ever be just because the Xeon has mesh and the 9900K has a ring architecture connecting all of the cores. But anyway, so VDDR, three phase, and guess what? More TDA2147s. So yeah, this is like 70 amp power stages, you know, three, three 70 amp power stages from powering the freaking DDR4 because DDR4 really needs a peak current at like a, well, it's not actually going to handle 210 amps just because it would produce way too much heat at that point. But you get the idea. Like this is stupid amounts of overkill for memory power. And there's two of those because, again, you, you do need two for each side of the motherboard. VCCIO and VCCSA are like the only two voltage regulators on this motherboard that are like even remotely sensible. But again, not because the ASP1405 here is just like they make cheaper controllers than this if you're not going to need, like, if you don't need more than two phases, why on earth would you use an eight-phase controller? Um, but anyway, uh, VCCIO and VCCSA are just the ASUS standard of the IR3553. So th this these aren't smart power stages, they are power IR stages, uh, so they're kind of like power, smart power stages, they're like almost there, but they're not quite, because the smart power stage spec is like a new thing from Intel that came out like recent, relatively recently, um, which is why also all of the data sheets are spec'd at 1.8 volts because it's really like design like these the smart power stages are basically designed for Intel server platforms. Um, that's where the specification comes from. It's basically from Intel. But uh, these are just 3555 uh, uh, POW, which they are POW IR, and that's the marketing name. Uh, stages and they uh, integrate basically everything a smart power stage does except not all of the protection features. So they have the over, uh, they have current monitoring, temperature monitoring, uh, body braking mode, but they, as far as I know, they lack over temperature and over current protection or they're implemented slightly differently. And the current monitoring that they have is not quite as accurate as the smart power stages. So yeah. I think at this point I've covered everything and this video is still over 30 minutes long. So that is it for the uh, Asus ROG Dominus motherboard. Um, it's, it's insane. It's huge. It's $1,800. And I mean, you know, you can't say Asus cut any corners. <laughs> <laughs> like there, there really is no corner cutting because at this point it was just like just just use whatever just how, how many how many power stages do we need in our eight phase just however many fit across the board like if the board was any larger I wouldn't be surprised if they had five you know power stages in each phase it's like why not right it still wouldn't really make a difference to the price point the the board's meant for a three thousand dollar CPU so yeah absolutely freaking insane motherboard um like, just, I, I, I don't have words to describe just how ridiculous this thing is. Um, and yeah, so that's it for the video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support Gamers Nexus, there's store.gamersnexus.net where you can pick up things like, say, the mod mat that you can see in the background of the photo. Uh, there's also mugs and t-shirts and other merch that you can find there. And there's also the Gamers Nexus Patreon uh, where you can support us directly.
and uh, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking, where I do other overclocking-related things and more PCB breakdowns. So it'd be pretty cool if you checked that out as well. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.